Well, this last week, um, much of my family and, and I had a chance to uh, be on vacation. We were in, uh, spent a week, uh, several days anyway, at Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, in the uh, Smoky Mountains, it's a beautiful area, had a great time. Uh, not far from where we were in Pigeon Forge, uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee is a little town, kind of in the, the foothills, in the, in the hills of Tennessee. There was a famous preacher who had a little church there. Fred Craddock was his name. Fred Craddock is a, famous for telling stories, and he was a little guy. He, was, he used to make jokes about just barely being able to see over the pulpit. He was a little, a little guy, and, and uh, he, he was in seminary. His first church he had was this little white uh, wood church in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and he would drive there on the weekends and, and preach and, and serve that church, and he had been doing that for a while, and uh, one weekend he was driving around the area, and he saw that there were several different little communities, kind of almost campsites, you know, trailer parks and, and tent areas and these uh, houses uh, that were put together very quickly and put up very quickly because there were different government programs programs that had building projects in that area and, and attracted workers who, who moved to the area, spent some time there, and maybe they moved off when the project was done or they ended up staying around. But at that time anyway, there were several of these little communities. And, and one Sunday, Fred was preaching in this little church and, and he mentioned in a sermon about how they, they needed to reach out to, to folks around them. And some of these workers who were uh, being drawn in by these workers projects in these little communities that had popped up in their area. He mentioned in the sermon that, you know, they, they needed to figure out how to best reach those new folks who were coming to the area. It, it just so happened that after that worship service that day, there was a, there was a board meeting at this church. And so Fred was in that board meeting and leaders were talking about stuff and they said, hey, uh, you know, young Fred, do you have anything you want to you wanna add? And he said, well, I, I mentioned this sermon today that there are these new communities and little uh, neighborhoods and we ought to figure out, we ought to sit down and really think about how we can best reach these new people coming to the area and these new neighborhoods and how we can reach them for Jesus. And there was a little bit of discussion about that, some positive and some not as positive. And, and so they, they decided, this sort of famously happens at church meetings as well, they decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going we're gonna to table this. We'll talk about it again at the next church meeting. And so Fred went back to school and came back the next week and anticipating this, again, having this conversation after the worship service and the, the church leaders gathered together in, in a room and Fred was there and he said, okay, what, what have we decided? And they said, there's no need to have this meeting, Fred, because we met while you were gone and we passed a new resolution and we decided that in order to be a member of this church, <clears throat> you have to own property in the county. And Fred said, I don't think that's a very good idea. And they said, that's okay, because they reminded him he didn't have a vote, and so his opinion didn't matter. And, and Fred just kind of, you know, he was a seminary student, and he thought that was a bad idea, but he, he was sort of at a loss at what he should do. And so he went about preaching and serving that church the best he could until he graduated and went off to a, a new ministry opportunity several years later. He and his wife were back in the area, and they, they drove to Oak Ridge, and, and uh, Fred said, you know, honey, we ought, to go, we ought to go find that church where it all started for us. And so they drove, and, and it took him a while to get his bearings. Things had changed and uh, looked a little different, but eventually they saw off in the distance that little white church building, and uh, Fred was sort of amazed because when, when he left that church, you know, there, were, there was kind of an empty parking lot every Sunday, but as he drove up to it, the parking lot was just jam-packed with vehicles, and as he got a little closer, he saw this, this new sign at the corner of the parking lot that said, barbecue, all you can eat, and it was lunchtime. So they decided, we, we ought to stop, we ought to go in. And so they stopped and went into that little church, and sure enough, it was a barbecue restaurant now. The, the pews were shoved against the walls, the, the organ was still in a corner, and he sat down and he looked around at all the different folks in that building. 
You know, there were folks from all over. It was obvious. And he sat down and they were looking at the menu, trying to decide exactly what they would have for lunch when he leaned across across the table and he said to his wife, honey, it sure is a good thing that this isn't a church any longer. And she said, well, Fred, what do you mean? He said, well, if this was still a church, none of these folks would be welcome here. Church meetings. I mean, sometimes... Sometimes church meetings are hard. They, they can, a lot of good can come out of church meetings. And sometimes, like in Fred's experience, well, a lot of bad can come out of church meetings. There's one really, really important church meeting recorded for us in the New Testament. And it's recorded in Acts chapter 15. I mentioned at the beginning of the service, it's sort of the middle of the book of Acts physically. But absolutely, it's the central, it's the heart of the book of Acts theologically. And so we're going to take a look at this really important church meeting in the first 21 verses of the, of the book of Acts in chapter 15, the first 21 verses of chapter 15 in the book of Acts. And, and I just want to walk us through sort of these four agenda items as I see it in this church meeting and see what we can learn from this really important church meeting. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Acts chapter 15. We're going to deal with the first 21 verses as we consider four different agenda items. Paul and Barnabas must have been so excited. I mean, there just had to have been a real sense of satisfaction as they had experienced all that they had on their first missionary journey, the ups and downs. They had certainly faced challenges. There had been instances, like just uh, the last couple of weeks, we talked about the fact that at least one time, Paul was left for dead. He was stoned and left for dead. And, and so there had certainly been obstacles and hurdles, and yes, even enemies who have tried to get in the way of Paul and Barnabas spreading the good news of Jesus uh, just about everywhere they went. But absolutely everywhere they went, from the island of Cyprus back to Galatia and all the different churches they visited and started there, they have shared the story of Jesus. And while there have been obstacles and there have been opponents and there have been hurdles to overcome, the story of Jesus has been shared shared and people have said yes to Jesus and responded and everywhere they went new churches were started in fact at, at the very end of that journey Zach did a great job of explaining how tired and hurt especially Paul must have been physically mentally and even spiritually at the end of that trip and yet they decided we're going back and we're visiting every one of these churches again and now they've arrived back at sort of their home base this, this home church, this place where they are most comfortable. They, they feel like they are with family. And they are telling all of those stories. And they are, uh, folks are celebrating the good things that God has done through Paul and Barnabas. And I imagine they're at this worship service one Sunday morning, and people are feeling good about what's going on. They're, they're excited because there's some new folks that have uh, joined the worship service, and they've arrived. And, and I just imagine, I can't say as if this is true, but I just imagine, you know, the potluck dinner that followed, and they invited their new guests, come on down to the potluck, and, and those new guests walked down to the, the gym at First Christian Church Antioch, and, and they're enjoying the potluck and they're, they're kind of looking out and they, they see their, their good buddy Barnabas from back in Jerusalem and he's sitting down at this table eating the pulled pork and cheesy potatoes with everyone else and they sort of go, oh, this is not what we expected and they're a little worried. They're a little more than worried, they're upset they don't shout and throw a fit right in the middle of the church potluck, but they do start kind of whispering to the guy they're sitting next to, is it always like this? Is this what you're really about here at church in Antioch? Do you know that there's more to following Jesus than just Jesus? And people start asking, what do you mean? Well, they, they say, well, for one thing, there's circumcision. 
And they say, what, circumcision? What are you talking about? And kids, you're just going to have to ask your parents. I don't have time for it. But they, they have this whole conversation about circumcision. Now, you can't, be, you can't be a part of the family of God if you're not circumcised. This is the way it's always been. Since the very beginning, when God called Abraham, there was circumcision. Uh, Paul and Barnabas eventually catch wind of this, and they confront that teaching right away. They say, this is not true, guys. You don't, don't listen to these visitors from Jerusalem. We've we, we got to stop this. Don't pay any attention. They, they can't really decide exactly what to do. And eventually the church says, Paul and Barnabas, why don't, you, why don't you just take these guys? Make sure you take these guys, but take these guys back to Jerusalem and discuss it with all the leaders there and figure this out. And so that's what Paul and Barnabas do. They're sent off by the church in Antioch again, this time back to Jerusalem uh, to figure it out. And, and they really come to the first agenda item in this important church meeting in Acts chapter 15. And that's what in the world is the problem, right? Why is this such a big issue? What's the problem? Let's go ahead and take a look at the first five verses here in Acts chapter 15. God's word says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and to the elders and, and, and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and, and to order them to keep the law of Moses. All right, and so we're going to just try to figure out together what's the real problem here. Verse 1 in chapter 15 just starts by saying, but some men. We don't know exactly who these guys were, those guests those visitors to the church in Antioch. We don't know exactly who they were. Uh, we, we do know that we can sort of you know, just look at these five verses, and there's some facts we can figure out about them, right? The first thing is we know that they were from Judea, that they were from Jerusalem. And this was a big deal because the, the church in Jerusalem was still a big deal in the Christian world and by Acts chapter 15. I mean, this was this is where, you know, it was founded by the 12 apostles on Pentecost. It was the center of Jewish worship. And so the temple was still there. It was, you know, the capital a long time ago in the glory days of David. Jerusalem's a big deal. The temple being in Jerusalem's a big deal. The fact that the apostles founded the church had to be, uh, to be a big deal. There was just some weight. There was some sway. There was some influence that came with being from the church in Jerusalem. And so when these guys showed up and they said, hey, we're from the church in Jerusalem, there was, there was some thought that, hey, they're kind of a big deal. They're all that in a bag of chips sort of idea. It was just a big deal that they were from Jerusalem. Secondly, we learned in verse 5 that they were from the party of the Pharisees. Now, when you read the Gospels, when we read the Gospels, the Pharisees are always the bad guys. You know, they, they wear the black hats, and rightly so in the Gospels. Jesus has a lot of confrontation with them. But I, I just need you to know that the Pharisees, they, they, were, they were folks, the Gospels talk, them about, talk about them as being zealous for God. They were all in on trying to follow after God and to keep his law, to live a righteous, godly life lifestyle. I mean, if you made a list of things that, what, what, a, what does a good follower of Jesus do? If you made a list, you would make a list of, well, they go to church, you know, worship, and they the Bible study, and they probably, you know, give to help, you know, folks, and you're generous, and help the poor, and we, we'd go on and on and on. We'd make a list of things that followers of Jesus do, right? I, I need you to know that Pharisees, they did that stuff. I mean, they were serious about that stuff. They kept lists and 
made sure that they were checking all the appropriate boxes. Uh, that's who these folks were. They were zealous for God's law. They were zealous for Israel. And they wanted to hold on to what made God's people, God's people, what made Israel, Israel. Uh, they were described, they, they become described by Paul, and, or at least scholars, as Judaizers in, in Paul's letters. They, uh, uh, what else do we know about them? We, we maybe uh, can draw a, a connection between John Mark. Do you remember a few weeks ago when John Mark left Paul and Barnabas and he returned to Jerusalem? And he gave all kinds of reasons. Maybe John Mark left for these reasons. And then one of those reasons, potential reasons, was maybe John Mark got in the middle of this missionary journey and kind of reaching these other people that looked and sounded a little different from himself. And he got uncomfortable with that. And so he went back to Jerusalem and perhaps there was influence there. I'm not pointing a finger at John Mark. I'm just saying that this is an issue that has been an issue for a long time. It's not something new here in Acts chapter 15. The decades that are represented between Acts 2 and Acts 15, this has always been at the heart of what's going on in the early church is how do we fit Gentiles in to following after Jesus? How do we, how do we grow this kingdom and, and uh, hold on to it? And so they're, 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 that's who these guys are. They, they are serious about following the law, and they're serious about Israel. And, and uh, So what's the problem? Well, they state the problem straight out in verse 1. At the end of verse 1, they say, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. You boil all of this down, all this conversation, all of these issues, you boil it all down and you get to this idea. What do you have to do in order to be saved? Do you trust in Jesus? Is that enough? Or should you trust in Jesus plus do some other stuff? And the position of these guys from Jerusalem, of these Pharisees, they, they said, man, you need to trust in Jesus for sure. He's really important, but you need to do this other stuff too. You need to keep track of this other stuff too. Well, why was it such a big deal to them? Well, as, as Jewish people, there are a few things that separated them from the rest of the world. Kind of the, the, there were three really public things that Jewish people did that separated them from the rest of the world. I'm including circumcision in this, this list, even though I don't know how public it was, all right? But circumcision is at, at the heart of this conversation. And it's one of these three things that separated uh, God's people from everyone else. Circumcision, the kind of dietary laws. Everybody knew you were Jewish because you didn't eat the bacon, right? You didn't, you, you know, there were laws that you kept. You had to keep kosher. And so there were these dietary restrictions. And then finally, Sabbath worship. These were central key facets to, to Jewish worship. When you read through the Gospels and you th see th the things that Jesus got in trouble with, Jewish religious leaders for, it usually centered around one of those three things. What's more important, maybe here in the conversation in the early church, is that there was a connection here between these three, three, these three things and then the fellowship, the table fellowship especially, who you could eat with and, and build relationship over a meal with was, was so important and the, these things were kind of tied together. Because uh, Jewish folks, they couldn't eat with somebody who was unclean. And if you, weren't uncir if you weren't circumcised, then you were unclean. And so you couldn't share a meal with them. As followers of Jesus, as Jewish followers of Jesus, this became really important because what was central to their worship? Well, the same thing that's at the center of our worship every Sunday, the Lord's Supper. And so if you couldn't eat a meal with someone because they were uncircumcised, you couldn't celebrate the Lord's Supper together with someone who was uncircumcised. And so there was a, a fraction. We read this and we sometimes think this is just a, a heady conversation about a piece of doctrine. But it, it was a source of contention that could fracture the unity of, of the church, the fellowship in the church. 
And so this was at the heart of this issue. This was the problem, that they couldn't uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper together, that they had to figure this out. What does this look like? Is it enough to trust in Jesus to sit at that table, or do we need to trust in Jesus and do these other things specifically to be circumcised? They couldn't come to a consensus there in Antioch. They said, go back to Jerusalem and figure it out. And so they sent Paul and Barnabas and these men back to Jerusalem and, and they, they head out and they arrive in Jerusalem. They're ready to have this conversation. The church has always been good at least one thing. And that one thing is uh, the church is good at talking. After this large group discussion, they get there and there's lots of people with lots of opinions and, and people have always been good at sharing their opinions. And so that's what they do and they're talking around this, and eventually the church leaders in Jerusalem say, maybe we ought to have you know, a conversation kind of amongst ourselves and really get down to this issue. And so they, they go and they have that conversation as well, kind of this closed-door session to discuss the, the issue of circumcision a little more. Finally, after every preacher and after every elder had their say, can you imagine how long that meeting must have been? After they all ha had their say, Peter stood up and he shared his story uh, by reminding the church that it, it wasn't uh, of what happened at Cornelius' house and the fact that that wasn't a new plan, that that had always, always been a part of God's plan since the very beginning. It's the second agenda item here, and that's just that there was much debate. And so the first agenda item, you know, there was a problem. And the second agenda item, there's much debate about that problem. Look at verses six and seven here. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and he said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. The apostles and the elders were gathered together. And so I, I think there, verse uh, 2 and 12 and 22, I think, in this chapter, there's conversation about the whole church being together, all right? And the best I can figure here is that th there's that conversation with the whole large group, and then the leaders of the church say, okay, let's, let's have a... Let's really get down to the nitty-gritty of this. Let's, let's go and, and kind of have this other meeting. And that's where we're, we're with the church leaders at this moment. And, and Zach did a great job last week of describing kind of this transition in church leadership from the early church, from apostles, the 12 apostles, to the uh, elders in the local church. And you can see that progression happen here. We don't need to talk a lot about apostles this week and whether this is the, the group of 12 capital A apostles in this meeting. I don't think it probably is. There's some of those folks present there, but not all of them, I imagine. And in this apostle, I think it just means missionary. So we're talking about Paul and Barnabas and Peter. You know, there's some of those who groups of, of the 12, but not all 12 of the capital A apostles are in this meeting. The elders are there. There's this transition of leadership, and they're having this conversation about, you know, what in the world they, they ought to do. Those are the leaders present. Verse 7 says... And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and he begins to, to recount his experience at Cornelius' house. After much debate. Uh, we, we don't know exactly what the conversation was, uh, what the debate was. We do know that there was debate, which means what? There wasn't just one opinion, right? There wasn't just one idea expressed. There wasn't complete agreement even among the leaders in that room. What I find most interesting, though, about what's reported here is what's missing. Because did you notice there's several times when there was much discussion, there was much debate. The language at the beginning of the story in the first five verses when the, the, those guests show up at the church in Antioch is that Peter, or, or Paul rather, Paul and Barnabas confront those leaders from the church in Jerusalem. It's not just this sweet conversation that's taking place. They're like, cut it out now. Stop it. You can't be doing this. 
I think this is too much of a rabbit trail, but we're probably in about the third meeting uh, with, uh, about this idea. And there was a time that, that's reported for us in the second chapter of the book of Galatians when you know, Paul makes another trip and has this conversation. That's probably Acts chapter 11. And they have the same conversation. And in between that time, Peter is, is uh, you know, eating with Gentiles until some folks from Jerusalem come around and then he's like well I'm not going to eat with Gentiles anymore and and Paul just throws it down you know with Peter has it out with Peter and said what are you doing buddy you can't act like this my point here is this was an intense conversation but do you notice what we don't get we don't get at any point in time where Paul says Peter, you're the worst person ever. You know, Paul doesn't say, Peter, you're a heretic. There's no place reported here where one side said, you're lousy and we're leaving the church. We're going to go start West Jerusalem Christian Church. We're sick and tired of it. We can't have it. It's the end of uh, following Jesus as we know it, right? Right? There's nothing like that. Folks, we live in a world where we are, we've lost the ability to disagree. Every conversation, I mean, for the next several months especially in this election season, every conversation is going to be the end of the world as we know it. I, I would... I would just offer to you that that's probably not true. You know, Jesus could come back at any minute. It'll be the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> Until he does, take a breath. Right? There's, there, there are these disagreements, and, and I can't communicate it in, in a bigger way, I don't think. I, I wish I was smarter and I was able to, to do it better, but this meeting is so important. In the life of the church, it's so important in, in what you and I call faith. And yet, there was disagreement here, and, and nobody is throwing rocks at each other. You know, nobody is, is, is just threatening to to leave or, or condemning the other person. We're going to talk more about this next week, but we have the ability to disagree with one another without condemning one another. And when we just get a glimpse of it here in this really important church meeting, the second agenda item, that there was much debate. There was a lot of debate. The third agenda item is that there was some evidence presented. So Peter stands up and he recounts what happened at Cornelius' house. And, and he gets to a point where he said, look, all we really need is faith. We, we have to trust Jesus. And, and we're saved by faith in Jesus. And that's it. And, and then uh, Paul and Barnabas are going to tell their stories about all the good things that God had done through them. And, and they're sharing miracle after miracle. And, and people, the room goes silent. You know, it's quiet. For the first time in a long time, that church is quiet. I think they get to a point where, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. And they're out of arguments. But James is a preacher. And he's the preacher of that church in Jerusalem. So he stands up when it's quiet in church. The preacher stands up and he starts preaching. And he goes back to the Old Testament. And he shares from the prophet Amos, look, this is what Amos said, and this is what the Old Testament said. And, and so all of these stories, and all of those experiences, and all of the evidence from the Old Testament, they point to the same thing, that God, since he called Abraham from the very beginning, from the very beginning, God wanted everyone to be a part of his family, under his tent, as a part of his kingdom. And this is what we're living in. James said, everyone's being called home. And now we're, we're seeing exactly what the prophets foretold. 
We get all of this evidence that starts in verse 8 here as we consider this third agenda item, the evidence. Verse 8 and 9 says, And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. This is Peter speaking. And he just lays it out. And what I love about verses uh, 8 and 9 is he says, okay, look, this gift of salvation, we know it's from God. It's not anything we did because God showed up at Pentecost and then he showed up at Cornelius' house. And so it's all about God. It's not about us. And secondly, he said, look, the issue here, did did you notice verse 8 begins with what? And God who knows the heart. Verse 9 ends with what? Having cleansed their hearts. Right? This change, this difference that's made by the gift of the Holy Spirit, a relationship with God, our creator, our sustainer, through our redeemer Jesus, is a change in heart. It's not a change in appearance. Right? It's not a physical shift. It's a spiritual change. And that ought to result in some physical actions, but it's changed from the inside out. And that's all Peter is teaching here. He goes on in verse 10 to say, verse 10 and 11, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Look, if you're in the habit of underlining in your Bible, and if you're not start, just underline verse 11. Right? Put a star next to it. Put it in parentheses something. Block it off because this is just the the heart of the theology of the book of Acts of the New Testament. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. That every single one of us, Peter says, is in the same boat. We are sinners who fall short of the glory of God in desperate need of a Savior. Jesus is that rescuer. He is that Savior. And it's trusting in Him that leads us into a relationship with our Creator God. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. And the assembly fell silent. Paul and Barnabas share their story right there in verse 12 and 13. Uh, They listened to Paul and Barnabas as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them uh, among the Gentiles. Those signs and wonders, that's kind of uh, important. Where do you recognize those words from? Well, all through the Gospels, right, there are signs and wonders as Jesus introduces the kingdom of God, as he ushers in the kingdom of God. And now it's not just Jewish folks who are part of that kingdom. It's not just folks in Israel, but it's folks from everywhere around the world. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter the people you know. It just matters one thing that you trust in Jesus and you can be a part of his kingdom you can be a part of his family and so those signs and wonders they've spread out of Jerusalem out of Judea out of Samaria out of Israel they've spread all around the world because we can all be included as a part of God's family And so they listen to those miracles that Paul and Barnabas have experienced. And it's interesting here, too, just the strategy, because Barnabas talks and Paul is quiet. Right? They're just like, hey, we're just like you. Remember your old friend Barnabas? He's from church here. He was in your Sunday school. You remember him? James starts speaking in verse 14. He says, Simeon, that's Simon. We know him as Peter. He doesn't give him the Greek name that Jesus gave to Simon. He doesn't even use Simon, the name that shows up most often when it's not Peter in the New Testament, like 48 times, twice or three times it's Simeon, which is kind of the Aramaic version of Simon. And it just, it just goes the same strategy. James is like, we are your people, right? We, we have the same experience, the same background. We're all in this together. And you remember good old Simeon, that nobody calls Simeon. They call, most people call him Simon. Most people call him Peter. But we're going to reach way back 
Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, uh, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who make these things known from of old. That last statement is kind of weird, but it's really just an amen statement. You know, James preaches this message and he says, look, you go back to prophets like Amos. He promised that Gentiles were going to be included in God's family. And this is how God has made a way for them to be included. Amen. They lay out all the evidence. Right? They start with Cornelius and Peter. They go to Paul and Barnabas and all that has happened on this missionary journey. And then James said, if you don't trust those experiences, you check out what the Old Testament said. You check out what the prophets say about this, and we'll open the book, we'll roll out the scroll, and we'll get to the, the, what, what Scripture says, and that's what James does. And they lay out this third agenda item, all the evidence, and then at the end of the message, James finally says, so what in the world should we do? Should we keep adding yokes? Should we make it harder and harder for people who don't look like us and sound like us and come from the same place as us to follow Jesus? Or ought we get those things out of the way? And let's just let the Holy Spirit make them new. And we'll see that they are followers of Jesus because they'll stay away from that idol stuff. Right? They won't, they won't pollute their lives with sexual immorality. We don't need a bunch of food laws, but we will know that they are followers of Jesus because they're going to fit in with us because we're all chasing after the same Savior. And so James concludes his sermon with saying, let's not add any more burdens. It's this fourth agenda item, the decision. Look at verses 19 through 21. Therefore, my judgment, James says, is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood and from the ancient generations Moses has had in every city, those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogue. He says, look, there are some things that are just going to be true of followers of Jesus. And the scholars, they, they love to kind of nitpick at this, and they say, well, James puts on these four qualifications, and Paul would have never stood for four qualifications to the gospel. I, I don't think Paul acquiesces. I don't think there's some kind of, 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 of compromise here at all. I don't think these are qualifications to how we're saved. I just think James says, look, when you trust in Jesus, you're going to follow after him. The Holy Spirit moves in when you trust in him in baptism. The Holy Spirit moves in and he changes your life from the inside out. And as he changes your life from the inside out, you're not going to have anything to do with that old life. Paul himself in his letter said, throw that off. Put on Jesus. You won't have anything to do with that old life, and we will know you're following after Jesus. We'll be able to sit at a table with one another, because we know you don't have anything to do with other gods. We can see that in your lifestyle, with your choices. There's no sexual immorality. We can see that with who you hang out with. All these things will will be proof that you are following after Jesus. You just need Jesus. But he's going to, he loves you too much. It's the same story, different verse. Jesus loves you too much to leave you where you are. These things have always, always been true. So they send this letter, and and that's what they tell these folks, is that we don't want to hinder you at all. We just want to see Jesus change your life. It's interesting, these qualifications, some scholars put them, uh, call them, and and, uh, we've been watching the Olympics. My family loves the Olympics. Uh, The rest of my family loves the Olympics more than me. You know, I tease Sherry, yeah, let's put that on. Let's watch people be really good at exercising. This is going to be fun. You know, and yeah, see how fast they can swim. Oh, good, they're swimming for a mile. That'll be really fun. Let's watch that. And amazing, right? She wondered whatever, hundredth medal or whatever it is. Uh, Very cool. 
amazing athletic accomplishments. I, we, we love the Olympics. My, my daughters and wife, they love the gymnastics and all that. It's cool to watch. You know, and as it got rolling, the opening ceremonies were on our television, and I watched this little bit. I had to leave, and I watched this little bit, and it ended up, and it was weird enough for me at this point, right? But it was just a song by Lady Gaga, and so I saw that, and I thought, whatever, and I left, and and then the rest of it happened, and I heard about it. I didn't watch any of the rest of the opening ceremony. I, the conversation I had with my son Clayton is, look, if Lady Gaga is your down-the-middle act, maybe think about that a little bit, right? Just, just consider that for a minute. And there's all this uproar about the opening ceremonies, you know, and I, I know I, a couple things stood out to me. All right, I'm going to try to be careful. A couple of things stood out to me. One is, uh, you know, I, when I saw it, I didn't really get uh, the Last Supper, to be honest. Like, I'm, I'm dumb. I'm counting the people. I'm like, there's more than 12 people. This isn't the, that, you know. And I can, when you put the picture of the Last Supper, you know, Da Vinci's, that's the deal, the painting, which, by the way, is not an accurate depiction of what happened at the Last Supper. That's for free. But so there's this picture... <laughs> There's this picture, and you put it up against the still shot of that, and I understand. That, yeah, somebody could think that that's the Last Supper, and you know, and I, I don't know. Should we be offended by that or whatever? And they're mocking God. They shouldn't mock God. Don't mock God. That's bad. You know, don't do that. I don't know if we need to shout about it, but don't. But then I saw Christians defending this by saying, no, 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 no. You don't understand. That's not the Last Supper. That's a depiction of this pagan festival. And I'm like, that's not better. <laughs> we, this, this, this Greek god of, of wine and other stuff, that's not better to be around. You know, that, that's not better to be, celebrate. Uh, is there a place for believers to stand up and say, cut it out? Stop it. Paul and Barnabas certainly did, didn't they? Remember just a couple weeks ago? I mean, they're bringing out the calf. We're going we're gonna to sacrifice this to, to Zeus and Hermes. And, and what did Paul and Barnabas do? They threw a royal fit. A Jewish fit. They tore the cloak, you know, they, we can't do this. This is blasphemy. Cut it out. There's absolutely a place for followers of Jesus to say, we can't have anything to do with this. Cut it out. Maybe my suggestion would be, perhaps it's not social media. You know, maybe the fight, if you want to call it that, maybe the conversation Maybe the influence ought to come in relationships we have. Like when you talk to your buddy at work about the opening ceremonies, if you are, <laughs> of the Olympics, I'm all for you saying, man, this is, it's, it's, it's pagan. We, you know, the, if that was the Last Supper, that's not what the Last Supper was about. Last Supper was about service and sacrifice and grace. It's not about looking out for yourself, which I'm slow, but as much as I can figure, that's what was being depicted in all of that. Hey, look out for yourself. Get as much as you can of whatever it is you want. I mean, that's the place where we ought to shout in our relationships. No, we don't want to be about that. By the way, man, it would be awesome if we had the foundation that Paul and Barnabas had of their actions kind of pre-matching their shouting and tearing of clothes and saying, stop it. Man, that's when the argument's a winner, right? When the picture that's worth a thousand words <laughs> 
you know, matches the thousand words, that's pretty cool. That's pretty powerful. It's always been a thing, you know, stay away from anything offered to idols, from sexual immorality. You want your life to, to reflect Jesus. Fourth agenda item is the decision. They send that letter off and, and uh, you know, church meetings. Man, Jesus is, has been, and always will be enough. That's what we learn from this important church meeting in Acts chapter chapter 15. Jesus is, has been, and always will be enough. You know the worst church meeting I've ever been a part of? It happened in this room. (laughs) I was a lot younger and dumber than I am today, and one of the first things we did, uh, Wallula uh, used to have a, a grade school that was a, a ministry of Wallula Christian Church. And for a lot of years, they ran that grade school, and, and there were different opinions about the, you know, how well it was, it was run and what happened and all those things, up and down, different opinions, just like this first church meeting in Acts chapter 15, lots of different opinions. If you polled people who remembered in this room today, there'd be different opinions about all this stuff. And one of the first things we did, this about 20 years ago, uh, when, when we got here, is we sat down with, we reviewed all the ministries, and we were having trouble finding teachers and doing things in this church, uh, in this school, and, and we met over and over with all kinds of different groups from that school, and trying to decide what to do, and in the leadership here, we decided the best thing to do is to shut down this school. We, we just can't do it well enough. We need to shut it down. And so that's the decision we had, and we had this meeting with all the parents. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but when you mess with other people's children, they do not like that, right? And so I'm explaining all the reasons we had and the decision, how we came to the decision, what we were going to do, and, and I'm explaining these things, and, and folks are not happy, and they are letting me know that they are not happy. I couldn't tell you one thing that somebody in the room said to me. I don't remember. You know, I can't tell you that. But what I do remember is looking up as somebody is shouting at me. And I'm just taking it, you know. Yeah, good good point. And they're shouting, and, and I'm looking at the back of the room, and my wife is in the back of the room just crying. Right? And I thought, oh, man, what in the world have I gotten myself into? You know, I still today think that was the right decision that was made. Probably we could have done it differently and communicated it differently and all those things, and people would have still been mad. But maybe we could have done that better or whatever. It was the worst meeting I was ever a part of. But you know what happened? You know, the the beautiful thing about this body of believers, you know, one thing we've gotten right is we didn't let that or any other disagreement an obstacle, just split the church or to break fellowship. The, the good things that God has done and continues to do through Wallula Christian Church. You know, we, we just recently, we have in the office over 170 backpacks for that Joy Meadows uh, uh, event in a, a week or two. You know, just the generosity of this church on display over and over and over again. We're going we're gonna to feed hundreds of people this third Thursday. Uh, tomorrow night, some of you will help shelter folks in the, the shelter of hope. This summer, we've had kids baptized at, at church camp, and, and we've had uh, kids whose lives were changed and families introduced to Jesus at Vacation Bible School. We've had students in middle school and high school serving folks in the community. Who, uh, we, we've had middle schoolers and high schoolers who have said yes to Jesus this summer because of the influence. Of, of Wallula Christian Church. Why? Because we didn't let our disagreements condemn one another when they didn't have anything to do with Jesus. Jesus is, has been, and always will be enough. Let's stand and worship him.